All right. Again, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, the first in a series of five, uh, the series entitled Building a Better Disciple, a Blueprint for the Christian Life. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. It is my pleasure to welcome you to session one. Uh, our focus today is on Jesus, the face of discipleship. Now, before we get started uh, with the webinar proper, uh, as I like to start all my webinars, I will begin with a short uh, little prayer. Because we have a little more time tonight than my normal webinars, uh, we're going to do a little more involved prayer tonight. We'll have a, a short opening prayer. We'll hear a, a reading from Scripture. Uh, just a brief uh, little bit of silence for you to, to reflect on that reading. Uh, a few more prayers, and then uh, we'll finish up, and we will get into the the webinar itself. So I invite you to get yourself settled in, relax, uh, get yourself into a prayerful position, uh, a prayerful spot, uh, remind ourselves that we are in God's presence wherever we are at tonight, and we will begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that we who glory in the heart of your beloved Son and recall the wonders of his love for us, may be made worthy to receive an overflowing measure of grace that that fount from that fount of heavenly gifts. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? They said in reply, I'm sorry, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, Filled with joy, let us pray more earnestly to God that he who graciously listened to the prayers and supplications of his beloved Son may now be pleased to look upon us in our lowliness. For the shepherds of our souls, that they may have the strength to govern wisely the flock entrusted to them by the Good Shepherd, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For the whole world, that it may truly know the peace given by Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters who suffer, that their sorrow may be turned to gladness which no one can take from them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our own community, that it may bear witness with great confidence to the resurrection of Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. O God, who know that our life in this present age is subject to suffering and need, Hear the desires of those who cry to you, and receive the prayers of those who believe in you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Well, again, welcome uh, to everyone who's joined us tonight for, uh, again, this first uh, in a series of five webinars. My name is Jonathan Sullivan. I'm the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for our diocese to host these webinars from time to time. It's always a pleasure for me to be a part of them. Uh, just a little bit of my background. I'm originally from Kansas City, although I've, I've lived in a number of places around the Midwest. I went to college in Quincy, Illinois, at a small Franciscan school there. Did my graduate work in St. Lewis at Aquinas Institute of Theology with the Dominicans there. Uh, I am married. I uh, have six children with another on the way. We're expecting our seventh in early February. And uh, some of you may know me from uh, some of my writing on my blog. Uh, my website is jonathanfsullivan.com. And I certainly uh, welcome you to uh, check that out after the webinar tonight to uh, find out more of my, my presentations and the different things that I, I do there. So that's a little bit about me. Now I want to find out who we have here with us. Uh, who is, as it were, in the room? Uh, so I'm going to launch a poll for you just to see who's here. 
Uh, just select the one that best represents who you are in your parish, your diocese, your school. If you're a catechist or a teacher, if you're a catechetical leader, and that can be a DRE or a principal or, or something else, depending on what they call you in, in your community. Uh, if you're a priest or a deacon, let us know. A uh, liturgist or musician, or if you're an other or just an interested member of the faithful who somehow found out about this and thought this would be a, an, an interesting uh, webinar series to take part in. So I'm going to give you about another five seconds to make your choice. Very good. So uh, as you can see from our results here, we're about 45% catechists and teachers, 39% catechetical leaders, 3% uh, priests or deacons, uh, no liturgists and musicians with us tonight, and about 12% others. So uh, whatever your other role is, uh, we certainly welcome you and are glad you are here. Before we begin, I want to talk just a little bit about um, how these webinars are going to work and a little bit about uh, how this series came about. Uh, first, uh, a few points. If, if you've participated in any of our, our previous webinars, they've tended to be very much information delivery, a lot of presentation. Uh, my hope for this series is not to be so much information delivery. There is going to be that. That will certainly be a part of it. Uh, but I'd like this to be a little more personal, a little more reflective, uh, a little more personal spiritual enrichment, if you will, uh, to really think about discipleship and how we engage in the work of discipleship. Uh, in whatever our particular role, whatever our particular vocation might be. So uh, there's going to be opportunities to respond, so please participate. Uh, a few times during the course of the, the webinar, I'll throw a question out and ask for your responses. When I do that, use the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, you can see what that looks like on your screen here right now. If that control panel closes, you can open and close it by clicking on uh, the orange button here. That will let you know, uh, that will let you open and close that control panel throughout the course of the webinar. And then, again, use that question box there to respond to the questions. And I'll do my best to answer them. I, I probably won't be able to share all the responses that we get. Uh, I will also say, because we're recording these webinars as well, I'll only use your first name, so uh, we'll try to respect some privacy here because uh, this will be uh, recorded and made available to folks uh, after the fact. So a quick overview about, about how this webinar series got started. The, the history really goes back, uh, well, I guess really almost two years ago now, uh, with the, the initiation of a pilot project that my department here in our diocese did with uh, Saints James and Patrick Parish in Decatur, Illinois, which began in one of our department meetings. We were kind of sitting around, and uh, I don't remember how we got to the point in the conversation, but one of our directors looked around the room and said, you know, with all of our... Uh, experience and education and wisdom in this room and our collaborative nature, you know, what would happen if all of us here just took over a parish for, for one year and went and did our ministries in a parish for one year? What would that look like and how could that transform a parish? Now, obviously, we couldn't do that, but it really got us thinking about how could we partner with uh, parishes or at least to start out with a parish to help bring to bear some of the things we've been talking about and working on together. And um, we started to think about discipleship and holiness and, and what do disciples look like and what do they do and talk about and how do they act. And we came up with a list of holiness indicators. That was kind of our shorthand. You know, if, if you had to have a checklist uh, of what holy people look like, what would that be? And so we, we came up with a list and we narrowed it down, combined some things and came, came up with about 12 different things. And so then we, we came to this parish. We, we went to St. James and Patrick Parish and talked to the pastor and said, we want to come for one year. And once a month, take a Saturday, five hours on a Saturday, we're going to talk about these holiness indicators, one indicator a month, and just share with your parish, anyone who's interested, you know, talk about it, how do we do it, how do we get this to work in our parishes, how do we get it to work in our individual lives. And we said at the outset, we'd be happy with 20 people in the room every month, you know, that was kind of our goal. Uh, well, for the very first month, uh, when we started out, we had about 90 people in the room, which we were, of course, ecstatic about. Uh, and, it, and it, you know, over the course of the year, you know, we had attrition and, and, and people would drop out. But in the end, we had a core group of about 30 people there every month, uh, which, again, we were just really, really pleased with. So at, at the end of that, uh, you know, we started thinking about how do we carry this forward. And so this webinar series is one way in which we're trying to kind of carry forward that work from this Journey of Discipleship project. Uh, 
with the idea of kind of, you know, taking again these holiness indicators and distilling them down, because what we really discovered was when we kind of had to come up with a, a grounding for all of these indicators, what we found was it was really in the Acts of the Apostles, and, and specifically in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And we'll talk a little bit about that at, at the end of tonight uh, as we prepare for the rest of the weeks of, of this series. But we really found that that vision of the early church and what the early church did to build up their communities, build up their faith, that was kind of what we discovered was the core. We could really connect everything to, to what we found uh, in that verse from Acts of the Apostles. And so that's really the genesis of this now, to, to try to carry this forward, to continue that conversation, continue to uh, bring that vision to bear uh, in our diocese and, and beyond. So, uh, again, thank you for, for joining us uh, and being a part of that work. Uh, we are very, very blessed to have you with us. So here's what that's going to look like in terms of an overview of the entire series. Tonight we're going to be looking at Jesus, the face of discipleship. Uh, next week we'll look at scripture and tradition, uh, that the teaching of the apostles, as the early church called it, and what that looks like. Uh, the third week we'll look at the Christian community as really the grounding for discipleship. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear me say quite often uh, during that session, I'm sure, that it's impossible to be a solitary Christian. You can't be a Christian on your own. Christianity assumes and demands community. So I uh, will discuss that. The week after that, we'll look at liturgy and prayer, which is really going to be foundational to understanding the work of discipleship and how we, uh, how we grow as disciples and, and enter into the paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, uh, which should undergird all that we do uh, in our work as disciples. And then the last week, we'll look at vocation and mission. Now that we kind of have an understanding of what discipleship is, how do we put it into work in the world? How do we understand our own personal vocation? And how do we understand the mission of the church, evangelization, and um, and going out and meeting people where they're at? What does that look like? And how do we understand that as church? And how can we participate in that as disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing, very, very broad look uh, over the next five weeks uh, starting tonight. So with that, let's start to talk a little bit then about Jesus Christ. And the, the question I want to start out with is, who is Jesus? We heard about that in the gospel reading that we heard in our, our opening prayer. Who is Jesus? It's one of the foundational questions of the Christian faith. I think at some point every Christian believer has to really ask themselves, who do I believe that Jesus is? You know, was he just a nice guy that lived 2,000 years ago? Was he just a prophet? Was he just a, a teacher? Was he just uh, someone who had some really radical ideas about how, how to live together uh, in the human condition? You know, at some point we have to answer that question for ourselves. Who is Jesus? So to start out with tonight as our first kind of participation here, I want you to ask yourself, what's one word you would use to describe who Jesus is for you? Uh, take a minute to reflect on that. Uh, what's one word you would use to describe Jesus? Uh, if you had to distill uh, to someone who asked, you know, who Jesus was to you, what's, what's one word that you would use? So uh, think about that for a minute. Open up that control panel and then type your answer into the question box uh, and we'll see uh, what people have to say. Peace. Oh, Michelle, that's a great one. Jesus is peace. Absolutely. Friend, Kristen, very good. Yeah. Savior, Christine, absolutely. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, multiple times <laughs> over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, savior again. Sa uh, yeah, Savior is popping up there. Teacher, Hilda, thank you. We'll definitely talk about that tonight. Rock, oh, what a great, what a great image. The Good Shepherd, Kathleen, yes. Love, loving. Roxanne, Kyla, thank you. Redeemer, absolutely. God, yes. Hope. Oh, these are great. And again, you know, it's, it's impossible to completely encapsulate who Jesus is uh, in just a word, but you're throwing out some great ones. Healer, absolutely. All those great stories of, of Jesus' healing uh, power. Serenity, wonderful. Shepherd, yes. I'll share what, you know, one of mine is, and again, I, I don't think any one word can really do it. But uh, one thing I often think about when I think about who Jesus is for me is uh, I, I don't have a a good word for it. The word I kind of have to kind of settle on is egoless. Uh, Jesus having no ego. And that really goes back to uh, 
a story I heard John Cleese tell once, John Cleese, the British comedian. Uh, he was telling a story about uh, when the Monty Python comedy troupe was coming up with the idea of um, the life of Brian, the movie Life of Brian. And what happened was all the, the members of the Monty Python troupe went out and kind of wrote their own little pieces, you know, knowing what they wanted to They wanted to do something about uh, the time of Jesus. And they all came back and uh, started you know, sharing the jokes they'd written, sharing the, the different scenes and skits and everything that they had written uh, for the movie. And what they came to realize pretty quickly was it was really hard to, to make Jesus funny or to, to have the humor, you know, making fun of Jesus. You know, they, they tried some of that and it just fell flat. And what John Cleese said was, he said he comes out of a school of comedy that uh, is all about inflexible characters in outrageous situations. And if you know John Cleese, um, you, know, you know he often plays characters like that, really rigid, uptight, stuffy, authoritarian characters who are just put in outrageous situations. And their inability to be flexible, uh, their inability to get over their own ego in those situations is, is a lot of the humor that John Cleese brings uh, to his movies, to his TV shows, and, and, um, and other things that he's done. And what he says is the reason that the, the Jesus material wasn't that funny when they were starting to write The Life of Brian was because Jesus had no ego, and so he was infinitely flexible. You know, Jesus always had the right word to say to people. He always had the right action. He was always able to bring his entire self with no ego involved to every situation he was in. And so for John Cleese, and I, I really I, I reflect on this quite a bit, that egoless, that infinitely flexible Jesus uh, really stands out as a wonderful character to think about uh, when we think about Jesus and the way he approached the world and the way he approached um, how he interacted with other people. So that's that's my word, is egoless, or maybe even flexible would be a good one as well. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. That was that was wonderful. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad it's working. I, I have to admit I was a little uh, nervous about how we're going to make the answering these questions work, but that was perfect. So thank you so much. So when we ask that question, who is Jesus, I think a good starting point is to remind ourselves that we aren't necessarily interested just in biographical facts. Uh, certainly that's interesting, and, and uh, you know, there's portions of that in the Gospels, obviously, you know, the, the life of Jesus. But when we ask that question, who is Jesus, that's not our primary focus. And I think it's important to remember that it wasn't the primary focus of the Gospel writers either. Uh, the Gospel writers were not writing biography as we in the modern world understand biography. They weren't interested in a chronology of events. They weren't interested in detailing every event that happened in a person's life from, from childhood up through uh, adulthood on to death, etc. And the Gospel writers even say this. Uh, Luke, in his Gospel, uh, at the very beginning, says, I, too, have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. That was Luke's purpose in his Gospel, to, to let this Theophilus know that the teaching he had heard, the teaching he had received, uh, was good and, and certain and true. Likewise, uh, the Apostle John, at the end of his Gospel, says... These things that have been written down, that his entire gospel, uh, these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. So John's pur purpose is to instill belief, to come to believe that Jesus is Messiah. He wants his audience to know that and believe it and claim it. You know, He's not interested in detailing every event in Jesus' life in an orderly historical manner such that, again, we in the modern world tend to think about as uh, being really important to understanding history and, bi and biography. That's, that wasn't the gospel writer's intent. They had a much deeper purpose in mind, and their writing absolutely reflects that. I mean, you know, we talk about the big gap in Jesus' life in the gospels. It seems like he's born, you get the, the finding of the temple, and then you know, you get almost a couple of decades just kind of missing <laughs> in terms of Jesus' life. They weren't they weren't concerned with that. Their purpose was to, to spread the faith, to make disciples, to fulfill that last command of Jesus. And so that was their purpose in writing. So we're not interested in biography. So in terms of our discussion tonight, what I really want to focus on is 
um, the three offices of Jesus, or sometimes it's described as the threefold mission of Christ, uh, and these, these may be familiar to you. Jesus is priest, Jesus is prophet, and Jesus is king. Uh, these are more than just biographical facts. Uh, they tell us what Jesus was about. They told us what his purpose was on earth. Uh, they tell us what he came to accomplish, why he did and said the things he did while on earth, uh, and what he still is doing for us today. Uh, we can't talk about these without recognizing that Jesus continues uh, these offices, continues this, these three aspects of his mission today, and they're just as true and relevant for us uh, as they were when Jesus walked the earth uh, so many years ago. So we're going to take a look at, at each uh, each of the three of those. And first, Jesus as Lord. Jesus is Lord because he rules over all. And this is demonstrated uh, vividly in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospels. Jesus demonstrates that he has authority over demons, uh, that he has authority over illness. Uh, he exercises authority over nature, the calming of the sea, uh, those great stories. He claims authority over sin and the ability to forgive sins. And ultimately, he, he exercises authority over death itself through his resurrection. And it's interesting, uh, when we look at this idea of Jesus as Lord and the authority that he has, uh, this appears uh, in the very earliest articles of faith that we find in St. Paul's letters. Uh, St. Paul in Romans says, If with your mouth you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That confession of Jesus as Lord. Uh, likewise, in Philippians, he says that God greatly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that's powerful. That's a, a really direct, and again, the earliest writings we have, you know, St. Paul himself uh, the very earliest years of Christianity, already this idea of Jesus as Lord is central to the Christian message, central to the proclamation of, of the kerygma. Now, it's interesting, though, because this idea of Jesus as Lord is one of the great scandals of the Christian message that's found in the New Testament uh, for two main reasons. First, because it was a challenge to the Jewish people to understand that, that uh, Jesus could be Lord. Um, for the Jewish people, God is Lord, and God is the only Lord. You may recall that uh, in the Old Testament, whenever the name of God appears, uh, they always replace it with Adonai, the, the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. So when you see that Lord in the, the small caps in your Bible, that's actually the word Adonai, Lord, replacing the name of, G of God in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, because of the Jewish tradition of not speaking God's name, they replace it with Lord. So over and over again we hear in the Old Testament that God is Lord, God is the Lord. And it's interesting because that use is even reflected today for us as Catholics uh, in the Mass. Uh, when we say, you know, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Uh, in the Sanctus, we say, holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. And even in many of the opening prayers of the Mass, you'll often hear uh, God addressed as Lord. So this idea of Jesus as Lord was a challenge to the Jewish people at the time in, in hearing the Christian message, because God is Lord. And so for Jesus to to claim to be Lord is to claim the power of God. Now, of course, we understand and know Jesus to be God, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, but that was a challenging thing uh, to those folks, that, to hear that Jesus is Lord. Likewise, claiming Jesus as Lord was a, a challenge to the Roman authorities of the time, uh, because for the Romans, Caesar is Lord. Uh, it's not that they identify anyone God as Lord, but for them, the, the Roman emperor was the Lord. And so Jesus' claim of being Lord and the Christian claim that Jesus is Lord is an affront to that secular power uh, in the Roman Empire. Jesus challenges those worldly powers by claiming their authority and claiming their place in the world. So that when Christians claim Jesus is Lord, that was a very politically charged thing to say in the Roman Empire. And obviously, if you know the history of the, the martyrs in the early church, you know that it uh, didn't always uh, wind up well for the Christians. Uh, uh, to be uh, proclaiming that. The, the, the authorities took great umbrage at that and, and did their best to try to, to quash it as quickly as possible. 
So, you know, we have to kind of ask then, you know, is it any wonder then that Jesus was crucified when he challenged uh, the religious and the secular powers by claiming the title of God and the title of Caesar? You know, Jesus is king, king on a cross, uh, which is, again, a, another scandal of the New Testament. We can say that here's Jesus coming in, proclaiming to be Lord, and, and winds up on a cross. Now, we, of course, know the rest of the story in the resurrection, but, um, you know, that, you know, we know that that was a challenge to the early disciples to, to try to understand who is this Jesus who's, who is king on a cross. All right. So second, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus as priest, uh, the, the second of that threefold mission uh, of Jesus. The role of the priest, uh, especially in the Old Testament, uh, was to help the people of God to offer proper worship. And it's very, very interesting when you actually read uh, the Old Testament. This idea of offering proper worship is actually the entire reason that God rescued the people from Egypt uh, in the Exodus event. This is a part that sometimes gets glossed over when we tell that story. Uh, but when you actually look at uh, why is God rescuing the people out of slavery? It wasn't just to establish them in the promised land. It wasn't just to get them out of slavery. God had a real singular purpose. And this is what Exodus chapter 5 says. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. Pharaoh answered, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. They replied, The God of the Hebrews has come to meet us. Let us go a three days journey in the wilderness, that we may offer sacrifice to the Lord, our God, so that he does not strike us with the plague or the sword. So the central message of that Exodus event is God is asking Pharaoh to let the people go. Again, not just to get them out of slavery, although I'm sure that, that was part of it. Uh, but the central idea there is he wants the people to go and make sacrifice in the wilderness. He wants to go and have them prepare a feast for him, which is, you know, really, uh, that's a, a, a holy sacrifice. It's, it's, a, a, it's a part of the, the Jewish worship was to uh, a feast for the Lord and creating uh, that, that festival idea is, is actually a, it's a it's a sacrificial idea that they're going to sacrifice animals and and the Holocaust to God. Uh, I, just as an aside, you know, Pharaoh asking, "Who is the Lord that I should obey him?" Here's here's the Lord again challenging that secular power found in Pharaoh. So God calls the people out of Egypt so that they may offer him fitting worship. Uh, now. In, it seems interesting, too, though, that before they're even allowed to really do that in the promised land, they, they have to endure preparation time. They're, they spend the 40 years in the desert. They have to be taught uh, the, you know, the, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Part of that is that God is teaching the people what they need to do in order to be prepared to offer him proper worship. Uh, it's only then that the people are actually allowed to enter into the promised land. But the, the part of the role of the priest, then, and, and Aaron in this story is the priest, uh, the role is for him to lead the people in that worship, which is what Aaron does in the story. Now, we carry this uh, into Jesus' time then, and Jesus is our high priest. Uh, now, in the New Testament times, the role of the high priest was to make annual atonement for the sins of the Jewish people in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he would enter into the presence of God in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, uh, in the very inner sanctum of the, the temple, and there... Uh, offer the prayers to ask God to forgive the sins of the people every year. Uh, the high priest also offered regular sacrifices on behalf of the people every day uh, in order to uh, offer proper worship to God and to ask for uh, forgiveness of other sins as well. Now, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, one of his central messages then is that Jesus is the new high priest. Jesus is the one who offers proper worship to God, who uh, makes sacrifices on behalf for our, our sins. And he points out uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, every high priest is taken from among men and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So the high priest is a representative, an intercessor between the people and God. And Jesus fulfills this role perfectly, uh, in part because he is the perfect intercessor for humanity, because he 
was God and took on humanity himself. Uh, that perfect union of humanity and the divine exists in Jesus. Uh, you know, that, that hypostatic union in, in theological language, this idea that Jesus is God and Jesus is human. And it's not that he's 50-50. He's not half God and half human. He is 100% God and 100% human. You know, that's what that dual nature of Jesus Christ really means. He's the perfect blending of both. And so he is the perfect intercessor for humanity because he is us and he is God. Uh, and in addition, he offers the most perfect sacrifice that he could on our behalf, his own body and blood on the cross. Uh, that is the sacrifice that Jesus came to offer on our behalf. And, uh, he is the Paschal Lamb, but it was sacrificed uh, for us so that our sins may be forgiven and so that we may then enter into eternal life uh, with God uh, in, in his kingdom. Now, beyond just, though, the, the sacrificial nature and that high priest aspect, you know, Jesus is also the one who teaches us to pray. Um, it's one of the roles of the priest is to, to help people to pray and, and lead them in prayer. Now, obviously, the, the most perfect example of that would be the Our Father. When the disciples come to Jesus and ask him, teach us how to pray, and the prayer that he, he gives them, the Our Father, uh, the prayer which is so central today to our own prayer lives and to our liturgies. Um, but beyond just the Our Father, uh, Jesus also teaches through his own example of prayer. Uh, and there's a number of different times in the Gospels where Jesus goes off to pray, you know, takes time to be with his Father. Uh, in the agony in the garden, when he asks God, you know, take this cup away from me, but thy will be done. You know, it teaches us that, yes, it is okay to ask for what we need or sometimes what we think we need, uh, but in the end, we always have to add, thy will be done, all things in accordance with God's will. Uh, so we can ask God, but even more than that, we're seeking to conform ourselves to God's will, and, you know, that example of G that Jesus gives us. I would even say that Jesus teaches us to pray through the lives of the saints. When you look at the saints, uh, you know, the as they progress on their paths of holiness, uh, be, many of them become deeply, deeply uh, people of prayer and deep prayer, uh, meditation, and sometimes even to the point of having mystical visions uh, of Jesus. You know, they so identify that their, their entire lives, their entire prayer conforms to the example that Jesus has given us. So even through the lives of the saints, like, I think we can see uh, how Jesus prays and how J Jesus invites us to pray. And the wonderful thing about the saints as well is uh, there's so many different examples there. It, it, you know, one of the wonderful things about the saints is their diversity. You know, uh, there no saint, no two saints are alike. Uh, so we can find the saints that most we most identify with, who give us the best example for our lives, uh, and how they pray and how they sought to conform themselves to to Jesus's example of prayer and the way Jesus uh, lived for the Father. So uh, the saints, another wonderful way in which Jesus teaches us how to pray. And then finally. Uh, Jesus is priest because he acts in and through the liturgy. And we'll talk more about this, uh, quite a bit more about this, uh, in a couple of weeks when we talk about liturgy and prayer. But just for now, just to point out that uh, you know, Jesus is really and truly present when the church comes together uh, to pray in liturgical prayer, whether that's uh, in the Mass or in the other sacraments or in the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, Jesus is really and truly present there. And in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, number seven, uh, I really invite you to, to, to look that up and, and read it, because it's a wonderful, just short paragraph, which talks about how Jesus is present in the liturgy. And it gives us four ways that Jesus is present. First, Jesus is present in the gathered assembly, because as Jesus promised, uh, where two or three are gathered, he will be there. So whenever the Christian community comes together uh, to, to pray and to give praise to God, uh, Christ is there. Second, Christ is present in the person of the minister, in the priest, uh, who acts in persona Christi. Um, Jesus is really truly present in those actions, uh, in that person uh, of the priest. Uh, Jesus is present in the reading of sacred scripture. I think this is one that can sometimes be easy to overlook, because it's easy uh, when we listen to scripture at Mass or in other settings to think, you know, that, that's nice, you know, written uh, centuries ago. It doesn't have a lot to do with, to, to do with me today. Uh, but what the Church tells us, and, and, and Sacrosanctum Concilium Number 7 really takes pains to point out is, whenever scripture is proclaimed, it is Jesus who is proclaiming, Jesus who is speaking to us, uh, to us today, it is Jesus speaking, not just 
when the words were written, but Jesus speaking to us here today in our present situation. So always in the reading of Scripture, Jesus is present. And then finally in the sacraments, and especially, of course, in, in the Eucharist itself, and uh, under the appearance of bread and wine, uh, Jesus really and truly present there. And uh, one of my colleagues always likes to point out, you know, we, we love the Eucharist the best because it's what Jesus asked us to do. Uh, but Jesus is really and truly present in each of these. Uh, and so we, you, the next time you're at Mass, you know, just be thinking about that. Where is Jesus really and truly present right now at this moment in Mass? Uh, look for those. And I think you'll be surprised how easy it can be to find Jesus in those different places, not just up on the altar, uh, but in those other, other places that the Church teaches us Jesus is really and truly present uh, when we come together to pray in the liturgy. And then finally, Jesus' prophet, or the language I'm going to use here is Jesus' teacher, because um, I, I think there's a real similarity between you know, prophet, prophets and, and teachers uh, in this sense. Jesus was a teacher. He, he taught within the Jewish rabbinic tradition. Um, the rabbi is a, a word that means teacher, and it's used in three of the four Gospels as a title for Jesus. Uh, St. Luke is the only Gospel writer who doesn't describe Jesus as a rabbi, but all three of the other Gospels uh, really take pains to, to describe Jesus as rabbi and, and to help us understand that his disciples who came to him were looking for a rabbi, were looking for a teacher to follow. Now it's interesting though because Jesus is a Jewish rabbi but with a twist. The first twist is that uh, Jesus kind of upends the traditional teacher-student role uh, of the Jewish rabbi. Uh, in that particular time, uh, in the Jewish faith, a, a rabbi would go out, but the disciples uh, would choose to follow them. Uh, you know, it was the student who chose the rabbi. You know, they would find someone that they liked that they wanted to learn from, and, and they would go and follow that teacher. Jesus, on the contrary, chooses his disciples. He invites them to come and follow him. He tells them, come and follow me. Uh, and then gives them special teachings. And it's interesting to, to note uh, the number of times that Jesus will uh, be talking to the crowd and teaching to the multitudes, and then will we'll draw his close disciples, his apostles and his close disciples away uh, to give them a special understanding, a special teaching about uh, what he's been saying to the crowds, giving them special insights. Um, you know, next time you read the, if you read the Gospels, you know, look for that because it's a kind of a recurring pattern. Jesus has his close disciples, the ones that he's really teaching and, and focusing on and, and having a close relationship with, the ones that he really invited to follow him and made his own. The second twist, though, uh, is that Jesus teaches of his own authority. Um, and, this is actually in one of the Gospels, you know, a couple of the Gospels. Uh, you know, the people are surprised at the way that Jesus teaches because he teaches as one having authority, which isn't the way that most rabbis would have taught back then. Uh, they taught based on uh, other authorities. They would cite other sources for their teaching. So that could be, uh, you know, the, the Old Testament writings that were available available to them, especially uh, the teachings of Moses and, and the various Old Testament prophets, you know, would cite those for their teachings. Sometimes they would cite other great teachers, other great rabbis whose writings have been written down uh, and passed on from, uh, from rabbi to rabbi. So they, they would cite on other authorities uh, to, to demonstrate why their teachings were authoritative, why they were correct. Jesus, on the other hand, teaches from his own authority as the Son of God. And, and this was a real departure for uh, anyone who knew what a, a Jewish teacher was. You know, this would have really surprised them. Uh, but it, it makes sense when you understand, when you put Jesus in the context of being the Son of God. Uh, Jesus is the Word made flesh. He is the Word. Uh, and so he has that authority to teach the Word. Um, often on the Sermon on the Mount, you'll hear Jesus say, You have heard it said, and then he'll quote uh, sometimes an Old Testament passage, uh, and the, but then it'll add, but I say, you know, interpreting that Old Testament law uh, in light of his um, his own authority as the Word of God. I love the way the Catechism actually describes this. Uh, the Catechism says, in Jesus, the same Word of God that has resounded on Mount Sinai to give the written law to Moses made itself heard anew on the Mount of the Beatitudes. Jesus did not abolish the law, but fulfilled it by giving it its ultimate interpretation in a divine way. 
You know, Jesus did not come to abolish the Old Testament law. He came to fulfill it, to give us the proper understanding, to put it in its proper context. And so that is why Jesus can teach authoritatively uh, as the Word of God, as the Son of God, as the second person uh, of the Trinity. Because Jesus is God, he has authority, and he uh, uses it to teach us, both his disciples back 2,000 years ago, and again, us today when we read the scriptures, when we seek to understand better the teachings of the church. Jesus is teaching us today uh, because he is God. So with that, I want to throw out another quick little question. Of these three uh, offices, of this threefold uh, mission of Christ, which one do you most closely identify with? Uh, which of the three speaks to you, priest, prophet, or king? So take a minute to open up that control panel again, go into the question, and uh, write it down. And maybe even if you can, give a little explanation of why. Uh, what is it particularly that speaks to you? And I, uh, you know, I know we don't have a whole lot of time in terms of taking time to type out answers, but uh, you know, just kind of, if you can, give us some flavor for, for why it is you pick the one you want. So Francis says Jesus is priest. I think a lot of people identify with that one uh, because of the, the sacrifice and the way he helps us. Uh, Nicole says priest, he's helping me to pray more. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Francis, adding on to that, Jesus is the victim and the celebrant of the sacrifice. Yes, absolutely. The high priest who, who sacrifices himself, who gives of himself. Uh, Barbara, priest, offers healing and forgiveness. Very good. Uh, Margaret says, prophet, the teacher. Good. Uh, Hilda says, teacher, because he helps uh, me know how to live my life. Good. You know, I have to admit, uh, you would think working in catechesis, uh, you would think mine would be teacher or prophet, uh, I actually identify more with Lord, at least right now in my particular uh, period of life. I think because uh, I'm a diocesan bureaucrat, <laughs> uh, that idea of authority uh, and responsibility uh, really kind of rings, uh, rings for me. Uh, because I have responsibilities over a variety of offices in my department, you know, I have to manage people, I have to direct work, uh, you know, help shape a vision. Uh, Jesus is my model for good leadership, uh, proper use of authority, uh, how it is that we live as leaders in the church. So for right now, at least in my particular uh, life, Lord's really the one that speaks to me. Vicki says, prophet, Jesus teaches us how to live life according to his will. Very good. Uh, Patricia, teacher, how to live as he wants. Kristen, prophet, he teaches me so that I can teach my students. Yes. I mean, what and what a great role model for those of us that are catechists especially, uh, for how it is to teach. Uh, Jesus was just a, a, had a wonderful way of reaching out to people and, and, uh, and giving them just what they needed. Uh, Terry says, king, the forgiveness of sins. Yes. Uh, Lawson, prophet, because he calls me. Yes. Uh, Michelle, Jesus' teacher, the perfect model of faith. I love that. Uh, Meredith, King, because he is and always has been the one we pray to and ask for strength. Yeah. Roxanne, Jesus is prophet because he teaches and inspires me daily. Good. And Lana says, priest, he's always leading and guiding us. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you again for sharing. That was great. Um, so then the next question I want to ask then, uh, not for, for responses, uh, but just for us to start kind of thinking about. So if Jesus is priest, prophet, and king, if we start to have an idea of who Jesus is, what he was about, why he did the things he did, and, and what he continues to do for us, then who are we? If we have to ask that question, then who am I in relationship to Jesus Christ? You know, how do we describe ourselves? And the answer I would propose is we are disciples. We are those who, uh, who acknowledge Jesus in his threefold ministry. So we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, and, and that means that we give all to him because he is Lord, because all belongs to him. Uh, we give it all over to him. I, I have a colleague, my, my colleague Tom Quinlan up in the uh, Diocese of Joliet, has a wonderful way of talking about this when he when he talks to catechists and tells them you know when you're trying to encourage uh, young people or even adults <laughs> about going to mass on Sundays. Tom says that you know we should never say you know it's the least you can do to for God is to go and spend an hour in church on Sundays. 
you know, he points out that's that's really kind of bad theology. I mean, we we say it, we understand what we mean by it, but really, that idea that it's the least you can do for God, that's it's kind of bad theology because really, all that we have comes from Him, and so all that we have is the least that we can do for God. Every breath we take is a gift from God. And so the least we can do is to give it all back as gift to God. Uh, you know, when we say it's the least you can do to spend an hour in church, you know, it's a really diminished view of, of what it is we owe to God as Lord. Uh, so, you know, reflect a little bit on that a little bit. Uh, you know, think about that. What is it that we owe to God? We owe him everything. He has given us everything. He has given us our very existence. So we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. We give it all over to him. Uh, we worship Christ, and, and we worship him and with him, uh, first because he is God and is deserving of our worship, uh, but also because we join our prayers to and praise of the Father with him. You know, Jesus prays to the Father. He gives thanks to the Father. We join with Jesus in doing that. So we worship him and with him. And then finally, we seek to follow Jesus and his teachings. And to do that, we need to follow the example of, of the apostles and the early disciples, for whom following Jesus and, and uh, his teachings wasn't just about writing the things down on paper and putting them into a nice little folder and, and you know, these are the teachings of Jesus and this is what we're going to do. You know, Jesus' calling of the disciples was really a call to come and know him, and not just an intellectual knowledge. Um, not just you know uh, codified and you know knowing that Jesus as the second person of the Holy Trinity and the hypostatic union and all that. Um, it's not an intellectual exercise, which is not to say that we can't use our intellects to come to know Jesus. Um, but really, it's about a, a real lived experience of Jesus in our lives, of knowing Him intimately, of, of befriending Him, uh, asking Him to, for help, and and spending time with Him. Uh, which is sometimes language we don't always use as Catholics, but uh, I think especially, uh, you know, certainly with Pope Francis, I think with Pope Benedict, uh, really reminding us over and over again that, that Christianity isn't just a, a series of, of doctrinal propositions, but it starts with an encounter with a person. And so really allowing Jesus to teach us, to, to be uh, our teacher, means getting to know him and to experience him in our lives and recognizing that that's a lifelong process that we can't just get it with 12 years of Catholic education and then, all right, that's it. You know, we never have to uh, continue to form ourselves or, or seek to know Jesus deeper. Because Jesus is God, you know, he has infinite depth. We can never plumb that relationship fully. We can never uh, get to the bottom of it. it. It goes on and on throughout our lives. And because we change throughout our lives, the way we relate to Jesus is going to change throughout our lives. So seeking to know ourselves in such a way that we can approach Jesus uh, in a way that's going to be most meaningful for us and, and most authentic for us uh, wherever we are at in our lives. So what that can also mean, then, is that we're called to imitate Jesus. Uh, if that lifelong process of getting to know him, of conforming our lives to him, uh, it means we're called to imitate the, him. And, and sometimes, you know, that can seem impossible. Because Jesus is God, and we're not. <laughs> uh, you know, it's something we have to remind ourselves on a regular basis. I'm not God. Uh, Jesus was God. And so it's, it's, I think, a fair question to ask. Is it possible to imitate Christ? Well, it's what we've been asked to do, you know, to, to imitate Jesus, even in his perfection, um, even knowing we're going to fall short of that. Uh, and we can do it because of the mystery of the incarnation, because Jesus took on uh, our very nature, human flesh, you know, became one of us. Uh, that's the bridge that makes imitation of Christ possible. I love the way St. Athanasius put it uh, in his writings. He said that God became man so that man might become God. And he didn't mean that in the sense that, you know, we are all going to become, uh, you know, omnipotent and omniscient and, and all that. Uh, you know, we're not going to be God literally. What he meant by that was God became man so that man might participate in the divine life of God, that we may one day come to enter into God's presence and know God so thoroughly and so intimately, you know, to, to gaze on the face of God, uh, you know, that we are, we are almost one with him. That's what St. Athanasius was talking about here. And we do that through our participation in the Paschal Mystery. 
uh, in that life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. It's by participating in the Paschal Mystery that we are we are able to enter into that divine life. We are able to imitate Jesus Christ. So the more that we can conform ourselves, the more we can participate in the Paschal Mystery, the more that we're going to be able to truly come to know Jesus, truly become his disciples, and God willing, at the end of our lives, enter into full relationship with him in the, in the, by seeing him face to face. Now, we enter the Paschal Mystery through baptism. That's really the, the starting point for our relationship with Jesus Christ is when we are baptized, whether that's as infants, whether it's as adults, uh, that experience of entering into the Paschal Mystery through baptism. Because it's in baptism that we become uh, disciples, that we enter into relationship with Jesus. The Church tells us that baptism is the sacrament by which its recipients are incorporated into the Church and are built up together in the Spirit into a house where God lives, into a holy nation and a royal priesthood. That's a, that's a pretty awesome statement, that it's through baptism that we become one with the Church, the people of God, the body of Christ. It's through our baptism, and we become built up together into a house where God lives. We reside with God. And not just as peasants, if we can extend the metaphor, or as, as, as the lowly, but as a holy nation and a royal priesthood. You know, I'm not sure we always appreciate uh, what our baptisms have meant for us as followers of Jesus Christ, that we're now a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Every single one of us, uh, because of our baptism, because we've entered into Christ's mystery, because... Um, we died with Christ and rose again with him through the baptismal waters. Uh, we've taken on the dignity of Christ. You know, uh, we have conformed more closely to what it truly means to be human. Um, and again, this is not a, a new idea, but again, the very earliest writings of the church, when St. Paul says in Romans, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And that new life is Christ. You know, Paul says again and again, we live for Christ. We've been made adopted sons and daughters of God. And it's because of that that we are able to participate in that threefold mission of Christ, that we are able to participate as priest, prophet, and king, every single one of us. Now, again, depending on our vocation, we may exercise those in different ways. But to follow Jesus, to truly follow him and conform ourselves to him, is to take on uh, that threefold office of priest, prophet, and king, whatever that means for our life, whatever that means for our particular way of living. Now, that can be really hard in today's world, though, because the truth of the matter is discipleship is countercultural. Uh, as we talked about, you know, it's a radical turning over of our life to Jesus Christ, and that's not something that our modern culture uh, encourages or talks about or expects. Uh, our culture today has substituted other lords for God, uh, has substituted uh, other gods for people to worship, and has accepted the authority of others to establish uh, credibility for teachings. So, you know, today, you know, we, we, we seek money, we seek power, we seek prestige and pleasure. Those are our, those are our idols. Those are the things that we seek after uh, that get in the way of our relationship with God. And again, it, you know, it doesn't take much plumbing of the New Testament to see Jesus talking about how those things uh, can be set up as false gods and can take the place of God in our lives so that uh, our pursuit of them will separate us from uh, that paschal mystery uh, by seeking after, let's say, power. You know, power seeks to, to build up itself and to lord it over people. It doesn't seek to serve. It doesn't seek to die to itself, which is what we're called to do again and again, day after day, in, in little ways. Um, if we're not doing that every day, we're not participating in the Paschal Mystery. If we're putting other things in its place, uh, we're not going to be building that habit of good living. We're not going to be building the habit of, of participating in, those way, in the ways of Jesus Christ that, that are going to lead us uh, to that that radical countercultural discipleship, uh, you know, I I'm not going to go over them all here, but uh, something else I would encourage you to, to to look at is if you're familiar with the book Forming Intentional Disciples by Sherry Weddle, uh, wonderful book, and in it she outlines uh, characteristics of true intentional disciples of Jesus Christ, and they're pretty radical, uh, you know. 
looking around at our parishes, you know, seeing the kinds of things she describes, people who spend a lot of time with other Christians, you know, seek fellowship with them, who know their charisms and, and seek to live them out in their lives, who, who know their vocation, they can articulate what their vocation is, who seek to know Jesus in a, in a radical way. Um, and Sherry has done workshops and, and done consulting with parishes around the country. She often will ask pastors, uh, you know, kind of looking at this list, what percentage of your uh, the people in your churches on Sundays, what percentage would you say are truly intentional disciples? And, again, this isn't a scientific survey, but the, the answer she gets back pretty regularly is about 5%. That about 5% of the people in church on Sundays, so not even talking about the people that aren't there on Sundays, but about 5% are truly, truly engaged in intentional discipleship. So I, I, you know, I, I think it just points out that this is a, it's a radical thing. It's not something that's easy. It's not something that comes naturally. It's something we have to work at and practice and, and build good habits of over time. And it's something that at times will will really have an impact on us when we look at what we're called to do in our lives. Um, you know, I know those of you that, uh, that are participating tonight who are Catholic schools teachers. You know, I know you have made great sacrifices to follow your calling as, as people who teach in Catholic schools. Uh, you know, you can go elsewhere and, and make a lot more money and, and maybe have an easier time of it, but uh, God bless you for, for following that call uh, to be a sign of contradiction in the world and not follow the path of money and prestige and power, uh, but to, to seek to give of yourselves for the good of your students and the good of your schools. Uh, that's, that's not something a lot of people choose to do, and so I, uh, I have you know, great respect for our, our Catholic school teachers because of all the sacrifices you make. So... Uh, Kind of our last little participation question tonight is, what is the dis difference to, that discipleship, that following Jesus has had in your life? Uh, if you had to kind of just, you know, sum it up in a, a short sentence or two, you know, how has being a disciple, how has being a follower of Jesus Christ made a difference in your life? And, and maybe you wouldn't consider yourself a radical disciple, but if you're here tonight, I, I have a suspicion <laughs> that you're seeking to follow Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, it's, it's made some difference in your life. You know, what would that be? How would you think about that? How would you phrase that in a sen sentence or two? What is the difference that following Jesus has made in your life? And I'll go ahead and start. I mean, I know one way in my life it's, it's made a difference is, um, you know, it's turned some friends uh, away from, you know, my wife and I, as we've sought to uh, deepen our relationship with Jesus, to follow the teachings of the church more closely. Um, you know, some friends have said, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of getting out there. And I, uh, you know, whether they had uh, problems with church teaching or just didn't agree with uh, having seven children, things like that. We've had some friends who unfortunately have, have uh, kind of turned away from us and we've had to uh, really mourn the loss of some of those in our lives, uh, people that we were very close to, especially in college, uh, because they don't understand uh, how we've tried to give it all over to Jesus, uh, that we've really tried to, to live that in our lives. And I'm not saying we're perfect by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but just even the, the little steps that we've taken. Uh, sometimes, uh, like I said, it's a sign of contradiction, and, and sometimes that's unsettling to people. Uh, here's some responses are coming in. Following Jesus has made all of the other stuff not so important. Uh, that's 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 really succinct. I, I I really like the way you phrase that. The difference is that everything has purpose, even the things that hurt. Oh yeah yeah, that's part of the Paschal mystery is trying to turn even our sufferings over to God and, and trying to find some uh, redemptive meaning in those to to see Jesus on the cross and to try to unite ourselves with Him. Uh, in all of our little sufferings and, and mortifications and the, that we encounter every day. Uh, uh, yeah. The joy of Christ's peace in my life must be shared through my attempts at discipleship. Yeah, that's, that's really, uh, that gets to the heart of it, doesn't it? That we have something we want to share, you know, so finding peace in Christ, wanting to share that with others. It has allowed me to feel secure in my beliefs and lessen the fear of the afterlife. Yeah, yeah. It helps us to feel assured that there's hope, you know, that, that this isn't all there is, but that it's, it's all leading towards something. By believing in Jesus, I have made it through tough times. I don't know how people make it if they don't uh, have Jesus to lean on. Yeah, Jesus, uh, you know, he really uh, can be there for us because he's, he's been through it all, uh, because he, he took on our human nature. 
uh, who and what I do every day and how I speak with my adult children. Yeah, that's, the, that's a big difference. Uh, given me strength in all things. Trying to make the best choices for myself and my family. Yeah, that's, and that can be a, a struggle, again, especially in, in today's world. Uh, you know, trying to guide our children and our families to, to do, uh, to keep things focused on God and not get sidetracked with uh, all the things that compete for our attention nowadays. It brings a peace I can't find anywhere else. Mm. Stay calm when times are tough and trust in his will. Uh, loss of family relationships, yeah. Yeah, and the, and Jesus said, you know, he he came to divide families, so that was going to be part of the cost of discipleship at times. Following Jesus has opened my eyes to God's will in each situation. Yeah, yeah, and that takes that can be tough too. You know, that process of discerning what is God calling me to do in this particular situation with, with these particular people. Uh, but he he gives us the the strength and the grace to do it. It gives everything a reason, even when I do not completely understand it. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, trying to understand things in God's time, that's a challenge. Uh, lost friends, been persecuted, character assassination. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately that happens as well. And uh, if you're, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I, I mentioned I'm a blogger, I'm involved in a lot of online activities, and boy, you know, the, the vitriol that can come out sometimes. Uh, online when people, you know, claim the, the name of, of Christian uh, can really be tough. Uh, I'm not feeling alone anymore. I'm more in peace. I think in my daily, f I think in my daily food instead of, of looking for future food. So yeah, uh, strengthen my faith and help guide me in all aspects of my life. Give hope and faith in the hard struggles of life and uh, gives me a model to treat others, even those who hurt you. Yeah. Yeah, loving even our enemies. Uh, what a again, what a, a radical teaching for us to try to uh, to try to take on in, in practice. It's it's not easy. Uh, trying to be non-judgmental and unconditional love. Yeah, and that's you know I think that's even a tough one even for people who think they're following Jesus. Uh, you know, not trying to assume that we know everything about people, uh, but you know, trying to understand where they're at in their their life situations and 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 the steps that they're trying to take to get closer to God. Uh, following Jesus has taught me to forgive uh, my enemies. Wonderful. Good. So I think, you know, just in this little small selection from this small group here tonight, I think we can see that being a disciple does make a difference. Uh, trying to follow Jesus, again, however imperfectly we do it in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, is going to have an impact. It's going to change us. It's going to put us in a radically different relationship with the world around us. Um, it can be a great help and a great strength uh, and bring many, many graces into our lives. Uh, but, it, but the one thing it really is never going to be is, is neutral. Uh, it's never going to uh, just make no difference whatsoever. Uh, following Jesus, seeking to be a disciple, is always going to have an impact. It's always going to shape the way we see the world, the way we act in the world. So thank you again for your, your wonderful sharing there. That was uh, really some powerful, powerful phrases there. So the last thing that I want to look at is just kind of setting us up then for the next four weeks that we'll be taking a look at uh, what I sometimes call the pillars of discipleship. Uh, there's a variety of phrases that this comes that this comes under. Uh, that's kind of the, the wording I'll be using um, is, is pillars of discipleship, and really comes out of again Acts chapter two forty two. It's talking about how the early Christians lived. Uh, how they interacted together, what they, they did in their day-to-day -day lives. And, and this is how it describes it, just, just one verse. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. That in a nutshell, I mean, if you had to really distill what the early Christians were all about, that one verse, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. And everything else flows out of that. The entire uh, great history of Christianity spreading across the entire world starts with that first Christian community that, that was seeking to do those four things. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be examining these pillars and how they can help us to understand and maintain our identity as disciples of Jesus Christ. And the interesting thing about these, these pillars is when you look for them, they show up all over the place in the church. 
uh, if you're familiar with the catechism, if you're a catechist or a teacher and, and you have some familiarity with the catechism, uh, you may be familiar with the four pillars of the catechism, the four sections of the catechism, which are reflected right there in in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Uh, the teaching of the apostles, that's the doctrine. In the catechism, it's the creed. Uh, the communal life, you know, that moral life, how we live together. Uh, the breaking of the bread is the sacraments and the Eucharist. And the prayers, how we pray. You know, that's the four sections of the catechism right there. Uh, if there's anyone on who works in the RCIA, who's on an RCIA team and is involved in that process, um, if you're if you're familiar with the the actual text of the RCIA, number seventy five in there lays out the program for formation that uh, catechumens are to go through when they when they engage in the RCIA, and it's these four things essentially. Again, it's it's knowing the faith, it's seeking to build up a communal life and to you know rub shoulders with other Christians, engaging in apostolic works, learning to pray. And, and being engaged in the church's liturgical life. You know, that in a nutshell is what catechumens are to do as they prepare to be received into the church at the Easter Vigil. Uh, so there's lots of different places that these, these pillars are, will pop up uh, if you look for them in the church. Um, sometimes when I'm doing summaries of church documents, uh, you know, I'll just kind of seek to write out, you know, kind of distill it down. And oftentimes, you know, you can connect everything in those to one of these four pillars. It's really, uh, maybe I'm just kind of, I've got, uh, Acts chapter 2 glasses on at this point when I'm looking at things, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting how often it'll crop up. So, uh, over the, like I said, over the next four weeks, we're really going to examine these these different pillars uh, and, and, and talk about then what they mean for discipleship and, and what it means for us as people who choose uh, to seek to follow after Jesus Christ. So next week, we'll be looking at scripture and tradition as kind of the boundaries of discipleship. They help to guide us on the path of discipleship. Uh, if you haven't already, please sign up for the second webinar. Uh, the URL will be emailed to you in a follow-up email to this webinar, so uh, that'll be there. Uh, if you're going to be joining us for the next few weeks, uh, you, know, you might just want to review Acts chapter 2. Uh, just take, you know, five, ten minutes sometime this coming week and just sit down with your Bible and, and open it up and just take a look at, at that section of Scripture. And then finally, just an FYI, after this webinar, a short survey will come up on your screen um, asking a couple questions, including giving you the opportunity to kind of pre-ask some questions for next week on Scripture and tradition. So if you've got some specific questions or a topic you would like addressed for next week, uh, I can't promise that I'll get to it, but if you submit it, uh, I'll try to make sure that that's answered and incorporated into the presentation for next week. So with that, that's uh, kind of the end of tonight. Um, I doesn't look like we're going to quite make the 90 minutes that I thought we would, but that's all right. Uh, if you have any questions uh, based on the presentation or just about the, the series in general as we uh, look forward to the next few weeks, uh, I invite you now to, to enter those into that question box. Uh, and I'm happy to answer them for you. I will mention, for those of you from uh, the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, if you're a teacher or a catechist who are taking this for catechist formation credit, uh, the participation form will be emailed to you tomorrow for everyone who attended live tonight. We'll send that participation form directly to you tomorrow. A uh, question from Francis, uh, do you have any suggestions that we review any particular paragraphs uh, of the Catechism for next week, apart from Acts 2? Uh, no, I'm, I'm really not, I'm trying not to assign any homework or, or pre-reading uh, for these. Um, so, no, I, I really don't have any particular paragraphs of the Catechism that I would, I would suggest you read for next week. Uh, but do, you know, check out Acts chapter 2 uh, as kind of a preparation for this. Will a participation form be sent to attendees from the other dioceses? Uh, I can do that, absolutely, if that would be helpful uh, to you. Uh, if you're doing this for credit in your own diocese, uh, I can. I'll, I'll do something very similar to what I'm doing for folks from my diocese, uh, and I'll just send, it'll actually be a form that would send out to everyone, so I'll just have two versions of it there, one for folks from our diocese and then one uh, for those of you from elsewhere. Happy to do that. Wait just a few more seconds, see if there's any more questions. Uh, if I don't get to your questions, uh, we still have time after 
we're done with the closing prayer and everything, I'll, I'll stick around and answer more questions then. Uh, how can I get young teens to see? Ev- how can I get young teens that I see every day excited about scripture? Boy, you know, if I had an answer to that, I'd be publishing it and making a lot of money. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll be real honest. Youth ministry is not my forte, and uh, I would not even claim to, to have my pulse on, on <laughs> teens today. So uh, I, I'm going to. I'm going to beg off that question for right now. Uh, if I get a chance, maybe I'll talk to our director for youth and young adult ministry here and, and see if he has a suggestion for you. All right. Uh, just a reminder that, again, this was a, a recorded webinar, and the, the video will be available uh, either tomorrow or the day after. Uh, it will be available on the website for the uh, the webinar series, which is at uh, bit dot ly slash better disciple or the longer version is uh, building a better disciple dot tumblr dot com uh, again all of that will be emailed out to you so don't feel like you have to go looking for it uh, as soon as I have those materials up I will send an email out uh, and let you know about them and uh, again if you think anyone that you know might be interested in this please feel free to share that link with them uh, even if they weren't available to participate live tonight uh, they can always watch the video and participate in any further webinars in the series that come up over the next four weeks uh, so I do want to end with a quick closing prayer uh, this is a prayer from the US bishops uh, from their document disciples called to witness the new evangelization um, you can look that up uh, on their website, and they have a wonderful prayer for the new evangelization at the end of that, uh, which I thought we would use for our closing prayer tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and merciful God, we pray that through the Holy Spirit, all Catholics may hear the call of the new evangelization and seek a deeper relationship with your Son, Jesus. We pray that the new evangelization will renew the church, inspiring all Catholics to go forth and make disciples of all nations, and transform society through the power of the gospel. We pray for all members of the church that we heed the words of Christ, do not be afraid, and strengthened by the Holy Spirit's gift of courage, give witness to the gospel and share our faith with others. We pray that we may become like the father of the prodigal son, filled with compassion for our missing brothers and sisters, and run to embrace them upon their return. We pray that all people yearning to know Christ and the Church may encounter him through the faithful who witness to his love in their lives. Loving God, our Father, strengthen us to become witnesses to the saving grace of your Son, Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Again, thank you all for your participation tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, spending uh, this past uh, little over an hour with you. Uh, again, I look forward to seeing you all next week, and those materials will be emailed out to you uh, once they're available tomorrow or the day after. So thank you all. Have a great night. God bless.